Um, my, my presentation is based by and large on the chapter that appears in the book that you will receive in your bag. So if you want to read more and avoid asking questions, then you can just read the chapter on surrogacy in South Africa. I think that the surrogacy situation in South Africa is very much the, probably the epitome of a, a regulatory framework. So what I will be doing is a, a brief historical introduction and a brief consideration, which will also permeate some later slides, of the impact of that history on the regulation of surrogacy in South Africa, the basic characteristics of how surrogacy um, is regulated in the Children's Act of 2005, some of the essential requirements for a valid surrogacy agreement, um, the role of judicial oversight, and then some current developments in conclusion. So the historical overview dates to 1987, when Corinne uh, George Ferreira gave birth to her daughter's triplets. She was, in other words, both the gestational mother of the child and the grandmother of the child, which caused, obviously, front page Sunday Times coverage for some weeks, as people were deeply concerned about the ethical, moral, etc., not to mention legal implications. And this led to an appointment of um, the uh, South African Law Reform Commission to do a report on surrogacy, which was completed in 1990. Uh, the timelines are quite important. This is a pre-constitutional era for South Africa. So once the interim constitution came into being in 1994, Parliament was not particularly uh, happy or comfortable with simply adopting the Law Reform Commission's uh, recommendations uh, willy-nilly and then appointed an ad hoc parliamentary committee to also investigate uh, customary forms of surrogacy as practiced in some of the indigenous peoples among some of the indigenous peoples of South Africa. This resulted ultimately in a final report of the South African Law Reform Commission uh, at about around that time. It did not result in any legislation, um, and ultimately, and I've said in my view, it was simply just tacked on to the Children's Act when that process had been completed. The Children's Act was a very dense piece of legislation, very widely consulted, a large project committee at some point chaired by Judge Belinda van Heerden herself, um, which did not debate surrogacy at all. Uh, we debated many other things, foster care, parental responsibilities and rights, and I think it was actually the researcher at the Law Commission who saw that there was no uh, demand anymore for surrogacy legislation, so he simply added it to Chapter 20 to the Children's Act. And that explains uh, a number of things. Um, the legislation that had been developed did not have a children's rights lens because children's rights did not exist in the pre-94 era. Uh, some of the criteria for the, for the validity of a surrogate motherhood agreement go right back to the 1990s uh, without any additional uh, thoughts being given to updating them. There are no regulations to this particular chapter of the Children's Act uh, because it was not provided in the legislation that the Minister of Justice or Health was empowered to make regulations. There was a lack of attention to anybody other than the surrogate mother, the commissioning parents, and the child. So there was no attention paid to any of the other actors in the, in the arrangements, such as intermediaries in clinics. We do not have a regulator or central authority because that was not provided for. And strangely, despite the work done by the ad hoc parliamentary committee to investigate and document customary forms of, of surrogacy, there is absolutely nothing in the Act about customary forms of surrogacy. So that is the, the historical overview. Now the characteristics of the legislation as it stands is that uh, surrogate motherhood agreements must have pre-conception confirmation by a high court. In, in, our, in our structure of courts, high courts are uh, quite close to the top of the pile um, and also quite expensive. It requires, therefore, that attorneys uh, prepare the surrogate motherhood agreements and that uh, advocates, um, uh, or barristers, as you would call them in England, are also involved in presenting the papers before the High Court, which means that essentially surrogacy is a preserve of the wealthy, since High Courts, uh, hi high courts are inaccessible to the vast majority of the population who are, are not well off. We don't have any idea of the numbers. We have a High Court in every province in the country, um, and in some provinces there's more than one High Court, uh, so there's no central database of records, but we believe, this is a guess, that the numbers annually are likely to be in the hundreds rather than in the thousands. Uh, although my colleagues in the room have the best 
uh, surrogacy expertise in the room uh, present today, we all believe that there should in fact be some attempt to collect national data um, and to see if there are uh, <coughs> uh, trends that emerge as to which courts uh, receive the most applications and if there are reasons why that occurs or not. Essentially, only altruistic surrogacy is permitted um, and expenses must be paid, to, may be paid, but only expenses, no commercial surrogacy. And I know that there's a dispute about the meaning of those words, but I'll, we'll see how it's worked out in practice. Uh, no commercial surrogacy is permitted. The essential requirements is that there should be no surrogacy tourism, so the, uh, the uh, commissioning parents should be domiciled in South Africa, um, unless there are exceptional reasons for deviating, uh, and that's in relation to the surrogate only, for instance, the sister is living abroad, but the applicants must be domiciled in South Africa. The agreement must be drawn up in South Africa. The parties must be <coughs> infertile or unable to give birth, and in the first constitutional case that we had on the issue, which I'm not going to go to in detail because it is explained fully in my chapter, um, the genetic link of one um, of the commissioning parents, at least, is required. Just by way of backdrop, um, commissioning parents may be same-sex, they may be uh, heterosexual, they may be uh, single. Uh, we do have a very strong constitutional equality provision which forbids discrimination on the grounds inter alia of sexual orientation, marital status, and so forth. So the genetic link of one party is required. Um, there was a case that Robin Freeman was involved in, I think, uh, as well as the Centre for Child Law, represented by Carabo Oza, um, in AB versus Minister of Social Development, uh, where the uh, applicant was unable to uh, provide a genetic link. She was a single person. She was successful in the High Court in having that declared unconstitutional as a violation of her rights, various rights, but one of the main ones was the equality right, but the Constitutional Court upheld the validity of the genetic link requirement um, on grounds that uh, the child's best interests, basically, I'm summarizing now, uh, were, were dominant and that it was in the child's best interests for various reasons to have a genetic link to the commissioning parent. And then there are various requirements in the Act that detail that the surrogate and the commissioning parents must be assessed to be suitable uh, for the tasks that they um, are involved in, and this done by way of uh, psychological <coughs> or uh, social background reports that must be tabled at court. Um, just to mention a couple of cases here that have surfaced. Um, Ex parte K was a case in which the surrogate mother was deemed not to be a suitable person uh, for the purposes of confirmation of the agreement. She was 19 years old, and she had already had her first child at the age of 16, and a subsequent one, she came from very, very poor socioeconomic circumstances, um, and uh, she obviously uh, was now only 19 years old already with two children. She dropped out of school, and the court was of the view that she had made really some quite bad choices in her life, and that she was not suitable. This was not the only reason why confirmation did not occur, but that she was not suitable to be a surrogate parent uh, in this case. A second uh, case in which the confirmation was uh, rejected uh, on the basis of lack of suitability of the commissioning parents this time was that the partners were in a same-sex relationship, but the one partner was not prepared to come out, and nor was he prepared to share a household with the other partner because it was prejudicial to his uh, professional practice. And the court was unhappy with the fact that this would not be in the best interest of the to be born child to be raised in a non-household where one parent was not prepared to publicly acknowledge his role as the parent of the child. The court did say this was not intended to be homophobic. The, the other applicant could apply singly to be a commissioning parent or else the, 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 the second parent could come out and agree to, to be publicly known as the, as the father of the child to be born. And these cases are illustrative of the fact that the I think, that I will come back to this, that the courts do go behind the papers and look quite carefully at suitability when they assess this. Consents are required, including consents of the partners of the surrogate. Um, and in the very first case, ex parte WH, right back in 2010, the court laid down a whole lot of rules about the nature of the disclosure, uh, financial disclosure to be made 
um, in relation to payments. It's a very, very detailed judgment, and in particular, no lump sums. It has to be actually itemized how much for this maternity dress and how much for that uh, doctor's bill and so forth. No lump sums because it could be a guise or disguise for commercial surrogacy. WH also required information about any previous surrogacy arrangements and what happened to them, um, and also that there be a peace clearance certificate uh, produced. So these were not in the statute, but they were developed by the judiciary. The Act specifies that no artificial fertilization may take place before the confirmation by a court, uh, and also not after 18 months post the confirmation by a court. Um, <coughs> And this is also made an offence. Now, there were some uh, dis dis uh, difficulties in the case in 2014, ex parte M, where the, the, the parties approached the court when the uh, surrogate was already 33 weeks pregnant. They had had a verbal agreement. Apparently, they had a previous incident where the surrogacy um, miscarried, and they were so worried about it this time that they didn't get pre-approval. And the judge had to go through all kinds of legal hijinks to try and confirm what was clearly an illegal surrogacy agreement in the best interest of the almost-to-be-born child. That was some very strange legal reasoning. It's also an offence to make it known that a person is willing to be a surrogate, but if you go and Google surrogacy South Africa, which I do sometimes, like two weeks ago, you will see surrogates advertising their, their services on the internet. The legal effect is that the child that is born is legally the child of the commissioning parent from birth, unless, as Judge Van Heerden pointed out in the question earlier today, the, um, there is a biological link to the gestational mother, and then she has a 60-day cooling-off period. Although, in practice, my understanding from the, the fertility clinics is that they, they do not approve of uh, surrogacy arrangements where there is a biological link to the gestational mother. Where the surrogacy agreement is just for some reason not comply with the Act, the child remains legally the child of the surrogate. Um, now, Section 301 of the Act lists the authorised payments, which you can read on the slide for yourself. Um, insurance, uh, loss of earnings, uh, expenses related to pregnancy and birth, confirmation of the surrogacy agreement itself, and so on and so forth. Two recent cases, ex parte HPP, involved a surrogacy facilitator uh, who was part of the surrogate agreement. And when the court probed a bit further about what is a surrogacy facilitator, it appears that she is a person who herself had been a surrogate mother. She'd given birth six times in the previous 11 years. And that she was uniquely placed to provide counseling and support to surrogate mothers, to assist them to remember to take their medication and so forth. The court was having none of this. It said this, this is not authorized by the Act. Uh, the Act is very clear about psychologists and lawyers and doctors and no surrogacy facilitators. And so the part of the agreement that authorized payments to her, she was employed by a clinic, was excised from the agreement. Ex parte K was the case I referred to earlier, of the 19-year-old. There the court was concerned that their lump sum amounts per month, even though in US dollar terms would probably seem to, be, to you to be quite meager, um, that the lump sum payments to her per month seem to be a disguised form of paid surrogacy, commercial surrogacy, given her very poor and adverse economic circumstances. And so the court refused to confirm it also on those grounds. Again, illustrative of the fact that courts are prepared to go quite deeply into the papers to, um, <clears throat> to pick up if there are disguised commercial aspects. Um, now, I come to the role of judicial oversight in Gauteng, uh, which is obviously where Johannesburg is, the most, uh, most um, surrogacy agreements would probably be there because it's a populous province. Uh, the judges have developed a practice manual. I mentioned that there's no central database, but there are guidelines from the court in ex parte WH, which also apply only in that province, but are probably used by judges in other provinces from time to time as well. In my chapter, I talk a little bit about the possibility of international surrogacy, um, because in ex parte WH, it was picked up that the applicants were uh, domiciled in Johannesburg, but one was a Dutch citizen and one was a Danish citizen, and this was their second surrogacy agreement in a period of nine months. So this did look a little bit like international surrogacy. 
I know personally of a child that was born a month ago to two Namibians um, who are not domiciled in South Africa. And this was done legally through a South African court, um, which means that obviously that court didn't look too closely at the domicile requirement because they domiciled in Bintook. And then there's also a case I know about that may be known to people in the room uh, involving two children which the surrogate mother now wants back. Um, <clears throat> those children are in the UK. They were born in South Africa. It looks very suspiciously like international surrogacy. Um, and the, the mother in this case was also the biological mother of the children. Uh, but the case is sub UDK in the UK, so I can't talk about it anymore, and I don't know any more about it, except to say that it does look like international surrogacy. And there's certainly a couple of websites, uh, if you Google surrogacy South Africa, that do seem to indicate that services are available to international clients, which is probably illegal. So current developments are com coming to my conclusion. There is a South African law reform current investigation into the right of the child to know his or her genetic origins, and you can read that report on the website of the South African Law Reform Commissions. Um, Section 41 of the Children's Act does allow a child to access uh, genetic origin uh, information after the age of 18, but not necessarily related to the identity of any donor. So it's very limited uh, and quite old-fashioned kind of medical information and so forth. Then we have a whole long process that started in 2013 of amending the Children's Act. Lots of amendments required due to faulty cut and pastes, changed circumstances. Um, I'm not going to go into any of them other than those that relate to surrogacy. And the version of the Amendment Act that I'm referring to is the February 2019 version, not the gazetted version of 2018 November, which apparently the Department of Social Development has now jettisoned in favor of its own version. But it firstly uh, cures the problem that there are no regulations because it empowers the minister to make regulations. Second, it uh, uh, <coughs> tightens up on some eligibility criteria um, requiring now, in line with ex parte WH, an indication of the circumstances under which the commissioning parents and the surrogate mother met. The courts are very careful to protect the idea that you can't go and advertise surrogacy services, nor can you get any money for introducing a surrogate to the commissioning parents. Indication of the circumstances of the surrogate mother, including her financial position, concern about um, exploitation and also about commercial surrogacy floating under the radar. Um, copies of all agreements between the surrogate mother and any intermediary or any other person who is involved in the process so we have seen since the initial preparation of the legislation way back in the 1990s how important um, the intermediaries and the clinics have become. And so therefore their, their involvement needs to be given much more heightened attention. And then full details and proof of payment of compensation for any services rendered as contemplated. Back. This will all now be in the principal legislation, not in regulations. And then there are new health and age suitability requirements. It doesn't specify what age, but it was of some concern in the AB case in the Concord that by the time the applicant got to the Constitutional Court, she was already uh, in her late 50s. Uh, there's no re requirement of health and age for the surrogate, um, but obviously the court was not happy with the 19-year-old in ex parte K, and one website I consulted says that the maximum age that of surrogates that they will consider is 42. And the High Court will finally get the power to dispense with the genetic link requirement on good cause shown. So it will open the door for persons like AB to be able to uh, access surrogacy um, if they are able to show that there is a good reason for that. And then just to conclude that the, um, in the Children's Act Amendment Bill, there is no intention to deviate from the present position that it is the High Court that will do the confirmation to bring it to a lower court, um, as is happening in other areas of the Children's Act, like guardianship, which was also reserved for high courts only. That is now being devolved to the lowest level, which will be the Children's Court. With surrogacy, it was felt it's not needed to devolve it to, to the Children's Court level, and rather keep it at the high court level and continue to engage with those judges that are interested in the field of surrogacy, and there are quite a few, um, to capacitate them better to exercise 
the judicial oversight role that they are in fact currently fulfilling. Thank you.